Hello, everybody, and welcome to Teaching While Disabled, where Plymouth State faculty are going to share their experiences with us. Um, of all the programming we've done this year, I have to say I've most been looking forward to this one because there's just some really wonderful people who are willing to join us and tell their stories today. Um, I am also excited to get up for one quick second and <laughs> go over to get my notes which I left on the other side of the room. There we go. Uh, because when I first started advertising for this event, I was so happy to hear from one of my colleagues um, who, is, who specialty is in disability studies and she has offered to moderate this session for us. So I wanna introduce to you all Beth Sweeney Fornoff. Beth is an assistant professor in special ed here at Plymouth State. Her teaching and research are focused on UDL, Universal Design for Learning, which is something we've talked a lot about here in the CoLab this year, um, and its applications in K-12 and higher ed. She's currently collaborating on projects that connect disability and critical race theory with UDL as a force to disrupt paradigms of normativity that support inequitable and oppressive educational practices, which I would just wear that whole thing on a t-shirt. I think many of you would as well. Uh, her work's been published in Teachers College Record and Teacher Educator, as well as the Journal of Post-Secondary Education and Disability. Uh, prior to her work in higher ed, Beth worked as an elementary and special ed teacher. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Beth and we will go from there. Thank you, Robin. And um, I am all for making that t-shirt. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> So be our next, next session. Um, thank you to all of the panelists who have come together today to share their experiences. And thank you to all of you um, in the PSU community who are here to hear their stories and to bear witness to the experiences of uh, your colleagues and your instructors. Um, I think as Robin said, this is gonna be a really um, interesting and um, exciting panel to, um, to listen to and learn from. So I wanna take a moment um, before we start to acknowledge the, um, one benefit of the virtual format. I know we often are kind of uh, bashing bashing Zoom, um, especially when we've all been on it all day. But um, one benefit of this format is that it does allow us some flexibility in being here on this space. So if you look at your screen right now, you will see some silhouettes of different body types um, and sizes. Some are seated on stools or chairs or in a wheelchair. Some are sitting with a cane or crutches or, you, or pushing a stroller. Some are lying down on the floor. And I share this image to acknowledge the diverse embodiments that we all represent um, and also to honor the reality that there are different ways of being in an occupying a space, whether that space is physical or virtual. Um, and so my hope is that uh, you all are making a space wherever you are that's comfortable for you, um, where you can listen in a way that works for you and learn from our panelists here today. We urge you to um, use the, your space in whatever manner um, is productive for you, take breaks as you need them, fidget, jot down notes, um, turn your camera on or off, whatever is most comfortable for you, um, tend to any family members or pets that need tending to. We will be here when you return and also please, um, just as a reminder, uh, mute yourself uh, when panelists are presenting just because that minimizes distractions for our panelists. You can go to the next slide, Robin. So just to go over the format for today's panels, um, we have uh, eight or nine members of the Plymouth State community who are going to share their stories with us. Um, they are, represent a range of different roles and disciplines and each panel is going to present for about five or six minutes. You may engage freely in the open chat during their presentations. Um, Robin and Martha will be monitoring the back channel um, if there's questions. If you have specific questions for a panelist, you can send me a private chat and I will keep track of those to pose them to our panelists at the conclusion of the formal presentations. Live captioning is available for this event. You will see it going right now. Um, and a fully captioned recording will be available in the next few days. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so just to review those options for engagement and participation. Um, so again, 
during the presentations, you have the option of sending me a private chat message. If you have a specific question for a panelist, I will jot it down and ask them when they're when all the presentations are done. Um, you can also engage with the open chat. Um, if you're a Twitter user, please tweet at open P at PSU open collab using the hashtag PSU open. Um, and then after the panel, the options for engagement remain the same, although you can also when it comes to the open Q and a feel free to use the raise your hand function um, in zoom which um, the image on the screen right now is just a screenshot of that with an arrow. Um, so that's everything. So I'm going to hand it over to Lourdes, who is our first presenter. All right, let me set my timer here so I don't go too long. So th thank you for inviting me to speak today and also uh, to those who are here to listen to what we all have to say. Uh, so my name is Lourdes Aviles and I am, among many other things I am and many other things I I do. I teach uh, meteorology courses, mostly these days, upper level courses uh, in atmospheric physics and those kinds of things. And I am visually impaired, but uh, that is a very simplistic description of what my uh, impairment is. So uh, there's a lot to it, but basically I have a mutation that corresponds with albinism. It's an oculocutaneous uh, albinism type two, but in my case, only the visual impairment effects are visible, uh, no pun intended. So um, normally we're used to people with very white skin, uh, no hair coloring and no uh, eye coloring, just the red through the, through the pupils but uh, I don't have any of that. What I have is a lack of pigment inside my eyes, which uh, at the least makes me uh, very sensitive to light. Uh, I am, uh, uh, it's called photophobia. So it's like afraid of light, which I'm not, but basically I overreact to when the environment is too bright. Uh, unfortunately, it also comes genetically linked with a very long list of, of visual problems that range from involuntary eye movement. My eyes move back and forth all the time. Uh, I cannot, my uneven focusing of anything I see. I do not have la uh, depth perception. Uh, basically, if you look at the bottom right image, the optical nerves from my eyes to my brain are not uh, normally uh, connected. They cross completely, so my brain does not mix the signals from both eyes. So I lack stereoscopic vision. So it's very hard for me to, to see, to have depth perception, especially when there's lots of light and, and dark contrast happening. Um, also, uh, my, the part of my retina that is meant for uh, the most uh, acute vision is underdeveloped. So my vision is not correctable. It's one of the people that people are trying to be helpful tell me the most is that uh, I, I should wear glasses, but glasses don't, don't really help. I cannot be corrected. My vision in the worst eye is 2200, which is the the top right uh, image shows what my vision is from a distance. And the middle image shows the, the normal eye has an indentation in the retina that mine does not have. If we could go to the next image, I can actually speak of what we are talking about today. So uh, I face a lot of problems that most people don't realize unless I say something uh, while teaching. So uh, I might not see that somebody's raising their hand, especially in very large rooms. It's very hard for me to learn faces connected with names, especially of the people that sit very far away. Um, if students want my help, I either cannot see what they're doing or I have to get very close to their work. Um, seeing the details of presentations, a lot of times I cannot see the details or I have to uh, ask the student what it says to please read it. Um, I also, just using a laptop for preparing my, my teaching uh, is hard because I cannot put a computer on my lap and see what it's in there. So uh, there's more in there, so anybody that wants to ask. But uh, in terms of solutions, um, 
technology has gone a long way since I was a little child. This is, I've been like this since I was born, obviously, because it's genetic. Uh, but I use from the simplest tools as a little magnifying glass to, uh, thankfully, all devices come with accessibility features for vision right now. So I turn on the magnifying and the zoom and different ones have different ways to do it. Uh, for example, at the bottom there, I simulated, I, I showed what happens with the three finger zoom on the iPhone that allows me to read when I cannot. Uh, in the middle, I have uh, I use an iPad for my course notes because that way I can control the font size. I, I cannot read the note, my own notes. So uh, I bring a, an iPad to the classroom that I can have larger text or I can expand as needed. I also have uh, glasses like the ones on top that are uh, by optics that I wear sometimes to be able to see presentations, but they're not uh, good for moving around because it's, they have a very low field of vision. Um, so uh, just to, to wrap up now, what I have had to learn is that because it's not very noticeable, my, my disability to those that do not know me very well or do not work with me uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I have had to learn to be more open about explaining this to my students, my colleagues, and for uh, asking for help when I need it. And uh, it's taken me decades to, to get to that point. And I think that's good enough for now and I can answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you, Lourdes. Um, next, we're going to go to Nick. All right, remembering to unmute. Okay, so uh, I'm Nick Helms. I'm new at PSU. I teach British literature. Um, my research is also in uh, cognitive literary approaches and uh, disabled uh, disability studies approaches to literature. So uh, let's see, also repping with my t-shirt. Um, so uh, let's see, Apologize for, apologies for the speed. The links work in this, so uh, I encourage you to come check some of this stuff out at your own time or shoot any questions my, my way. Um, the stereotype about uh, most autistic people is that uh, the majority of autistics are white and are men. So, rat, so to combat that, I wanted to give my time to the words of autistics who are non-speaking, who are people of color, who are women, and who are LGBTQIA+. Um, quick note on terminology. Um, uh, from Judy Singer, uh, 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 Singer coined the term um, neurodiversity, which talks about the variety of ways of having a brain as being a type of biodiversity for human, brain, human brains, neurodiversity. Um, within that, uh, terms have come around neurotypical, having what is considered a normal brain versus neurodivergent, having a brain that is considered atypical by mainstream society. And that's gonna come out, th come out through these quotes. Um, so what autism is not, it's not mind blindness. Mind blindness is a book by Simon Baron Cohen. Yes, that Baron Cohen uh, family um, that I came across early on in my research on mind reading and literature when I was looking for ways how literary structure, how literary character and how real people are sort of like cobbled together by the human brain. How do we figure out what other people are thinking? Here's what the publicity for Baron Cohen's page on from the publisher page says about his work. Building on many years of research, Baron Cohen concludes that children with autism suffer from mind blindness as a result of selective impairment in mind reading. For these children, the world is essentially devoid of mental things. That's from the early 90s. If that sounds fishy to you, it's because it is. Uh, Baron Cohen is still researching and publishing on autism and still leads a lab that's one of the lead ones in the world for autistic research. Conversely, here are some voices from actual autistics. Um, by the way, hashtag actually autistic is uh, one of the um, more frequented hashtags on Twitter if you're looking for this discourse and, and, and wanna see what people in the community are actually saying. So what autism is, it's a spectrum of neurodivergence. That spelling is deliberate. Um, if you've met one autistic, you've met one autistic, that's the, that's the saying. Um, so first, from Tito Rajarshi Mukhopadhyay's Plankton Dreams. Autistics are said to be a puzzle. A whole does not emerge from the parts. But what is lost by always thinking of holes? Isn't the world itself comprised of little pieces? Don't we always have the choice of focusing on the piece and not the puzzle? 
Neurotypicals move too fast to notice anything. The shadow of a falling leaf, of the smell of wet grass or a ripple on the lake. From Naoki Higashida's The Reason I Jump. So I do understand things, but my way of remembering them works differently from everyone else's. I imagine a normal person's memory is arranged continuously like a line. My memory, however, is more like a pool of dots. I'm always picking up these dots by asking questions so I can arrive back at the memory that the dots represent. Uh, Robin, can you slide? Sorry, I got into the quotes. No worries. All right, so what is autistic teaching? If that's what like autistic perception and autistic thinking, and those are just little, uh, little snapshots, um, non-linear, detail-oriented, looking for patterns. I mean, it's just sort of a beginning of the panoply of the spectrum. Um, so from uh, Melanie Yergo's book, Authoring Autism, to be autistic is to be neuroqueer. And to be neuroqueer is to be idealizing, desiring, sidling. And uh, your go is in part picking up this term from Nick Walker's blog, neurocosmopolitanism.com, where Walker defines the term and provides about like a dozen different definitions. But here's the one that's most pertinent to autistic teaching. So what does it mean to be neuroqueer as a verb? Engaging in practices intended to undo one's cultural conditioning toward conformity and compliance with dominant norms, with the aim of reclaiming one's capacity to give more full expression to one's neurodivergence and or one's uniquely weird personal potentials and inclinations. Um, I did not uh, realize that I was autistic until about two years ago, but I've been doing this in my teaching practice for as long as I've been teaching. And I've been trying to theorize it and come to understand it. And I'm coming around to understanding that it's a way of closely reading and slowly reading texts and people and theories that fits with my neurodivergence. Uh, finally, Leia Lakshmi Pepsna Samara Sinha, author of Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice, which if I could recommend one book for people to read during the pandemic, it's Care Work because uh, her talk about um, labor, communities of care, necessity for community-based care and disability justice is just fantastic. Um, but this quote is from an art article about, uh, entitled, as an autistic femme, I love Greta Thunberg's resting autism face. But most of all, I am not smiling, although I am lightly masking, an autistic term for faking neurotypicality because I'm surrounded by very normal looking white people. And I have a lifetime of practice toning down how weird I am in public in order to be safe. But as years of me looking weird and being unable to smile on command will attest, I still have a resting autism face. And according to the news, so does Greta Thunberg. And the rest of that piece is a defense of resting autism face. Um, so to recap really quickly and, and respect everybody else's time, uh, what's it like to be autistic and to be a teacher? It's, it's weird, it's nonlinear, it's constant communication difficulties, it's time tracking difficulties, but it's also a very different way of perceiving the world um, that can be overwhelming at times. I took a nap before this. Um, I, I took a nap in between classes because that's how I can do teaching. Um, but it also lets me slow things down and look at that blade of grass, that leaf, that reflection on the pond um, in a way that I think is really beneficial for, for me and my students and my research. That's it. Thank you, Nick. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole. I am a faculty member in chemistry and biochemistry. Um, and last year was my first year full-time teaching. So I chose a great year to, <laughs> to get started. Um, and so I have an autoimmune disease known as Sjogren's syndrome. Um, basically an autoimmune disease is what happens is your immune system detects your own healthy cells as being foreign and it initiates an attack against those cells. And in Sjogren's syndrome, um, specifically my immune system attacks any kind of mucous membrane in my body. So my eyes, mouth, um, several different organs are affected. And so I have dry eyes, um, mouth sores. Um, the biggest thing that affects me is probably my joint pain and fatigue. So all of the fluid in my joints is sort of constantly being attacked. Um, and then sometimes organ damage. So if I do too much, I end up with about a pancreatitis or I was in the hospital a couple years ago with meningitis. 
Um, so I have to be really cautious about how I manage my symptoms. Um, and then probably the biggest thing that affects my teaching is what a lot of people in the autoimmune world called brain fog, um, which I describe to people as that feeling that you sometimes have when you've driven your car somewhere and you've been thinking about something the whole way there and you get to your destination and think, I don't even remember driving my car, what happened? Um, so I have that kind of sensation a lot during the day. And um, when I'm teaching, I'll think, oh, did I remember to tell them that this morning? Or um, did I forget a meeting this morning? Those kind of feelings. Um, and for the most part, my symptoms are managed very well. There's no cure for Sjogren's syndrome, but there is a medication, which I think funnily enough, we're probably all really familiar with right now. It's called hydroxychloroquine, um, which you might recognize as the drug that we thought for a moment in the beginning of COVID might help treat um, COVID patients. That's since been disproven, but it's been an interesting situation for a lot of people like myself who take hydroxychloroquine for our illnesses because now there's a huge shortage of this drug and it's very difficult for us to get our prescriptions filled now. So that's been kind of an added challenge of teaching with a, an autoimmune disease. Um, and then I sort of laugh sometimes about the other ways that they say to manage an autoimmune disease, getting lots of sleep, which I think we all know is really hard <laughs> as um, someone in academia, exercise, avoiding very high stress, <laughs> which is always a challenge. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight the spoon theory, if anybody's ever heard of that. Um, it's a really great essay um, that a lupus patient wrote several years ago about how to explain to someone who's never experienced a chronic illness what it's like. Um, and so what she did is she gave um, her friend a set number of spoons, I think it was 12 spoons, and she said, everything that you do in your day, you have to give me a spoon to represent that amount of energy that you've used up. Um, and so a healthy person would have any number of spoons, but if you're dealing with an autoimmune disease, you have a set number of spoons and you really have to plan your day out. Um, and so her friend ran out of spoons at lunchtime. So it kind of um, highlighted how much we have to plan our day and kind of assess what we're feeling in the morning to know how we're gonna make it through um, the rest of the day. So my experience teaching, um, this being my first year, I knew the hours were gonna be long. They were longer than I expected, especially with our transition in the spring. Um, and that kind of 24 hour availability is something that I really have struggled with. Um, also the high amount of screen time um, has really affected my eyes and my vision. And um, I've had colleagues ask me, are you feeling okay? Um, because I always look like I'm, I've just cried, <laughs> but it's actually just um, the way that my eyes look. Um, and then just the juggling act of scholarship and service and um, prepping for classes, trying to juggle all that and maintain um, everything with this kind of brain fog feeling can be a real challenge. Um, so the things I try to do is be as organized as I can, which is hard for me. Um, I take a lot of notes, plan ahead. And I found that the best thing for me is to just be really open with my students, I'll say, guys, I'm dealing with this. I'm really having a rough day. I'm probably not gonna get your exams back to you when I promise, but I'll do it as soon as I can. And students have been really understanding about that. Um, and kind of the nice thing about that was I also had students who were going through something with um, their own health and they really appreciated my openness and, and then opened up to me. Um, and then setting boundaries and learning to say no when I can, which I think we all are, are struggle with at times. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, Robin. So I also just wanted to highlight um, my experience as a student with a chronic illness. So I was diagnosed when I was an undergraduate, which was a really challenging time. Um, I didn't have a diagnosis as a student, but I was very sick. And so a lot of my professors didn't believe me. They thought I was making excuses, um, which was really frustrating. Um, the, my campus was didn't have a lot of support systems for students like me with an invisible illness. I do look healthy all the time. Um, and I was denied housing accommodation several times. And so ha having that experience of being the student has really influenced my teaching. Um, so I said, I've connected with a lot of students who have chronic illness or are going through that process of being diagnosed with a chronic illness. Um, and so that's been really helpful, I think for both myself and them to be able to talk openly about that. Um, and so I try to just give students the benefit of the doubt when a student um, 
sends the email that they've slept through their alarm. I kind of remember when I was that student who I actually was in too much pain to get out of bed, but I didn't want my professor to know that. So I told him I slept through my alarm. Uh, so I try to keep that in the back of my mind. And for both my students and myself. About one minute left. Okay, um, so I'll wrap it up. Um, I just try to be really flexible, which I think is what we're all doing right now, also dealing with this pandemic and our own mental health. Um, so having flexible deadlines, um, not assigning work if it's not really necessary work. Um, I don't have a particular attendance policy and I try to be really open and have a lot of optional and dropped assignments. So whatever students are dealing with, they can kind of manage and it helps me manage as well. Thanks, Nicole. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Justin. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Justin Wright. For those of you who don't know me, I am in the math department and I have been dealing with depression for most of my life. Um, I was first diagnosed with it when I was about 16 or so and have been dealing with it ever since. So I think everybody knows um, a lot about depression um, in the world these days. So it's a general feeling of sadness, a loss of energy and fatigue. Um, often feeling of being worthless or guilty and often with thoughts of death or suicide. Um, and I guess I should throw in here, I know probably less about depression than like an average psychology student does. Um, it's just not something I've really made an effort in my life to learn about tremendously. Uh, but this is a short, a very shortened list of symptoms. Um, it can be a lot more broad. I, for instance, was diagnosed after I'd had a nonstop headache for about a year. And they said, you might be depressed. And we went a different route entirely. Uh, there are a lot of treatment options. Um, most people have heard of various kinds of antidepressants. There's obviously a lot of different forms of therapy out there and all sorts of different things that people can try. The, uh, the real danger of depression, it, for, in my opinion, is not so much the symptoms, but it is the depression cycle. Uh, this is a simplified version of it here. Um, but you, it's very easy to fall into this cycle and get stuck in it. Um, you have, you, I usually start with negative thoughts, thinking something's wrong with you, or thinking that things can't change. That in turn makes you feel bad. So then you act accordingly. You don't do anything that you should do. You sit around all day and then you wind up at the end of the day thinking, wow, I am worthless. I did nothing all day, which you then feel bad about. And you repeat again the next day. Um, so for me, I have found that the treatments that are most effective are the ones that just keep me out of this cycle. Uh, so I was on antidepressants for about 12 years before going through cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which is a form of therapy which you learn to reinterpret your own thoughts and choose to react to them very differently. Um, it doesn't work for everybody, but fortunately it worked for me. The downside of it is, uh, is I'm, I'm borrowing this, but um, it makes you militantly practical, which is not always necessarily a good thing for interacting with others. Uh, so when I'm dealing with uh, being a teacher with depression, um, some of the obvious problems are um, when I'm in a bad mood, in a really bad mood, it can be very difficult to deal with that in the classroom. Uh, and that can come in a few different forms. So uh, it is not uncommon to see in my course evals at the end of the semester, one or two st students say, I really enjoyed this class, but there were days he came in in a bad mood and you could just tell right away it was gonna be a bad class and it wasn't gonna change. Uh, then there's often, I feel like class is just kind of a waste of time um, that I'm not getting anything out of it. They're not getting anything out of it and um, that I shouldn't bother. Of course, that's, that's me being irrational. I have to tell myself that's not really true, um, but it's still a, a thought that's going through my head a lot of the time. Uh, when classes have, have ended, I do often feel stuck in, in questioning whether or not I've done things correctly or well at all. So I do spend a lot of time judging myself. Um, and it can be really easy to feel like students are, are judging you when you're dealing with depression or anybody's judging you. So if students are talking at the back of the class, my immediate worry tends to be that they're talking about something that I'm doing terribly. Uh, even what, the, oh, it's more than likely they're just talking about what I just said because they didn't quite hear me or something like that. Uh, and then one of the biggest things that I have to worry about is when the work goes away at the end of the semester, um, I, I, I fall into the depression cycle very easily because I don't have as much to do. So then I judge myself for not doing anything. Um, and so when the semester is coming to an end and I'm very stressed out, knowing also that I'm going to probably fall into the depression cycle a week or so later. That's always a really challenging time in my life. Can we go to the next slide? 
So like I said, there's a lot of treatments for depression. These are the things that I found work the best for me. Uh, I stay on a schedule. Uh, it is very detailed. It has workouts on it. It has walks on it. It has time to eat meals on it, everything like that. Sometimes I'll go so far as to put when I'm going to be in the car driving on it. Um, because if I know what I need to do next, I can do it without having to stop and think about it, which can be very helpful to me. Um, and so I use a lot of to-do lists and including in the spring, I'm taking a half sabbatical, but because I don't trust myself to sit around without anything that I have to be doing all day. So that will force me to still teach most of the days of the week uh, and I can use my other time appropriately. Um, I do sometimes tell people that I, I'm not a good teacher. I just pretend to be one when I'm at school. Um, and I will say, I don't think you should ever tell somebody with depression that if they pretend that they're happy, they will eventually feel better. It's terrible advice. But if uh, on the other side of cognitive behavioral therapy, I have learned that if I do fake it, uh, when I get to the end of the day and I look back and I start judging myself, I can tell myself I still made the choices I would have if I didn't have depression. Uh, and I feel just a little bit better about it, even if it was a little bit phony. And then finally, um, the best thing I can do is stay busy. I know this seems like just staying on schedule, but I also, I can't just do busy work. Um, clearing out my email would feel like a, wa a wasted day to me. I have to be doing things that make me feel productive in some manner. So tidying up a room would not make me feel better, but doing laundry would because the clothes had to be cleaned at some point anyway. Uh, and that goes for doing schoolwork, uh, grading, all of it. If I don't really feel like it has a benefit, uh, it can feel like not a good use of my time. Uh, and that's what I have. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Phil. Hey there. Um, I feel like uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about dyslexia, um, but to start off, I, I think I have to say that I've never actually been diagnosed. Growing up in the 70s, there wasn't such a thing that people admitted to or really tested for. So I think I had slipped under the radar for a long while and found uh, ways to compensate for the fact that I've really got like a, an output with words so I can read um, okay. You know, it's not extremely fast, but I can keep up with uh, reading things. But when it comes to writing and spelling, that's where I really uh, struggle. Um, and I'd have to say that I've become okay with myself not being able to do that because I've actually can do a lot of other things other people can't. I think the, the one thing that seems so unfortunate for um, people that have disabilities is the emotional toll that you end up shouldering from others. I remember in third grade um, during spelling bee, uh, my word was town and I didn't know how to spell it. And I kind of mumbled it and the teacher told me to stand up and yell it out loud, even if I was wrong. So of course I had to stand up and yell it out wrong. And then the teacher yelled at me, that's wrong, now sit down. So, you know, there was no real accommodations being made. And I think, um, you know, if you look at this uh, writing here on the, in the blue, that was read to me. And um, that's what I ended up typing out when I heard it. And I got to say, that looks pretty good. The last part of that, I'm pretty proud of because there's not too many mistakes. Um, the, the stuff on the right is what was being read to me. So it's not really a typing thing. If I was to actually write that by hand, um, it would be a lot worse. So it's incredibly difficult um, to make lists because I can't read my own writing sometimes. Um, and with teaching, it, I think I, by the time I started teaching um, in my late 30s, I realized that most people had some sort of a, a learning challenge that they um, either didn't acknowledge or had a hard time navigating. Um, so part of what I do um, that ends up being difficult is that it ends up 
taking me a long time to write what seems to be very simple emails or simple responses that most faculty have to do. Um, it literally, if I have to write a department email, um, takes me two to three hours. And even then I have to find somebody to help me spell check it. And I like my wife, but I wonder whether I married her because she is actually a good speller. I don't know. Um, I think the other problems that I end up with in the, the classroom are just day-to-day -day, um, writing, which I think works for me now because I, I admit very early on in the class on the first day that I have a problem and uh, the class is gonna have to help me out. And part of being able to do things academically is overcoming everybody's um, disability that they have whether it's spatial or writing or hearing, um, finding solutions uh, to get by on that. Um, grading papers is super hard because the students know that I can't spell. So oftentimes they wonder how am I going to critique or grade them when I can't do it myself. And um, I think fortunately I'm able to um, read things and I'm not a bad writer. Um, so, you know, those are some of the difficulties. I think the um, things that actually help me is having had a rough time in school and being a little bit misunderstood. Um, I think people were always surprised when I would produce something um, that was better than they thought my, based on how they judged my spelling. So I think people oftentimes um, didn't give me support because they thought, well, this guy clearly isn't very smart. He can't spell. And I think that's one of the, the biggest things that has made me a better teacher is realizing that uh, everybody has, um, that brains work differently. And unfortunately for me or people with, um, some sort of a writing issue that the world communicates through writing, not through welding or being able to think in space. So um, I have to put in the extra time it takes to get stuff done, which is what I try to communicate with my students that even if it takes longer, it might be unfair, but somehow we got to figure out ways around those things. Um, so because of that, I don't really judge <clears throat> when students come in and they don't have their work done um, because I know that for me, I often didn't get it done because it just took too long to write things and um, some pretty understanding and try to help and ask a lot of questions. Um, I One think, left. okay, I'm gonna end it there. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying to cut you off. Oh. <laughs> Wanna, I do want to say that I took some notes for the presentation, but the problem is I can't even understand what they actually say, which is not very helpful. Now I'm finished. Thank you, Phil. Um, next, we're going to hear from Hannah. Hey, everybody. I'm Hannah Davidson. I work in Campus Accessibility Services, and I teach um, in the English department as well. Um, so I apparently last night when I was making this slide had a sweet tooth or something. So you have this ice cream visual here. Um, primarily I'm gonna talk about uh, generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder, but I thought it was important to um, show that those are kind of um, sitting on top of some chronic medical stuff um, similar to um, similar things that Nicole was talking about. Um, and I, I just wanted to acknowledge that that's there as well, because the way that some of the symptoms of the, the psychological disorder and the physical stuff um, like interact can be complicated. So uh, there are lots of different kinds of anxiety disorders. Um, mine, my two, generalized anxiety and panic disorder. Um, for me, uh, not only are there lots of different types, but but different people have like different symptoms and manifestations. So um, for me, for the generalized anxiety part, um, 
constant worry. Um, everybody gets worried, yes. Um, but this is worry that is like disproportionate to the context. Um, so for example, um, if I were to make like a, a simple clerical error in my, in my office work um, that, you know, might be annoying, but it's not detrimental to anything really operationally. Um, and despite the, the fact that like, I have, you know, really super supportive, like colleagues and supervision and things like that. Um, the first thought upon making a mistake is that I will definitely be fired, like contrary to like what the actual evidence shows me. Um, so that, was, that would just be an example of like the, um, the sort of inconsistent um, response to, to a situation. Um, that's kind of tied into fear of failure, lack of worthiness, um, feeling like uh, I'm sort of um, kind of played a role and like not really like um, worthy of whatever like uh, position I have, whether that's like teacher or like accessibility advocate or parent or anything and I'm just not doing it well enough. Um, other ways that it can manifest for me. Um, so this one is not, not uh, totally unusual, but not as common um, when people think about what anxiety disorders look like, the um, involuntary facial or vocal um, movements or tics. A lot of people like associate that with um, um, different neurological things or like Tourette syndrome or, or something, but it was actually the first way that I knew that I had an anxiety disorder because it didn't feel like cognitive when I was a child. Um, but I used to do this fairly loud, like clearing of my throat um, whenever I was in a situation that was unusual or nervous, even though I couldn't, I didn't know I was nervous. I didn't feel nervous. Um, I still do it, you know, 30 years later. Um, it's just a little quieter and I have a little bit better control of it because I've, I've practiced. Um, but people who are close to me, uh, anybody who comes within six feet of me who's like nobody right now, um, it, like for, for long enough um, has probably heard it occasionally. Um, it can also manifest for me an executive functioning issue. So I have a hard time staying organized, staying focused. Um, I can get really easily distracted by anything that's not um, the thing I'm supposed to be focused on right now. For example, my 10 year old just quietly creeped out of his bedroom and is walking behind my computer, um, looking like he needs something. Um, <laughs> and and uh, if I wasn't, you know, feeling comfortable talking to uh, to uh, um, a kind crowd, I might be a lot, that, that could be enough to be enough stimulus to, to make me panic, right? I'm not panicking right now though. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the, the cherry on top, the panic disorder, um, that is like, basically when you, if you, if you think about like, if you've ever fainted, um, like that feeling you get like right before you faint where you get kind of like sweaty and dizzy and then feel like you might like vomit but then, then you don't because you just pass out. Um, so a panic attack for me is uh, like that feeling right before you faint, but it persists. Um, and it's really physically uncomfortable. And if, if folks who don't have a panic disorder have those symptoms, you should probably should go to the hospital. Um, so when I was like a, a teenager and young adult, there was a lot of like, when I first started experiencing panic, I was probably actually about 20 the first time it happened. Um, there was a lot of uh, going to the hospital because I was just sure that I was having a heart attack. And that was like very embarrassing because I, I knew that it was probably psychological, but my heart really was pounding. Like my, my blood pressure really was skyrocketing even though I didn't have any cardiovascular issues. Um, so, so yeah, that was definitely difficult um, as I was trying to figure out how to sort of live with this. Um, thank you, Robin, you anticipated the, <laughs> The slide shift. Um, so just uh, professional impacts, uh, my stuff that is uh, difficult um, is, I said imposter syndrome deluxe. I know people, especially in academia, uh, experience the I, this, this feeling that like, you know, they're not good enough, they're not professional enough, they're not uh, established enough in their field. Um, I of course have that too, but I have it like all the time about everything. So that's why it's, that's why it's deluxe. Um, I had mentioned uh, having trouble with executive functioning occasionally. So um, it can make me disorganized. I sometimes am able to see like big picture things really well, um, but smaller details get lost. 
um, and then panicking about the possibility of panicking. That that is, um, yeah, something I think about every time I am going into a classroom or I'm going to present to a group of people. Um, that one more minute left, Hannah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have any, you know, particular fear of public speaking or anything like that. It's not a phobia, um, but the idea of having a panic attack when somebody else might see me is what's really scary. Um, so yeah, the, the, the positive impacts on my teaching, uh, I think it makes me uh, more, um, have more empathy and more compassion for students. Um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, aware of what it's like to, to sort of um, live with an invisible disability. And I think that, that that helps me in understanding where my students are coming from. Um, I seem probably like a much uh, more practiced and just a better teacher than I actually am because I have to plan everything really carefully and like practice so I can mitigate some of the panicking about the possibility of panicking. Um, so my students get, you know, a really, you know, really, some really solid lessons, which is good for them. Um, and then just my overall attention to accessibility and equity. That's, uh, I think, for most of you who, who know me know that's become really the center of my, my professional world right now. Um, but it definitely is derived from and bleeds over into my personal life as well. That's it. Thank you, Hannah. Um, we're going to hear from Domenica next. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, my name is Domenica, but I go by Dom. Um, and I have dyslexia and I have attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity. And I have anxiety and I have kidney disease. Um, can you, sorry, can you go back one, one slide? Sorry, I was no, trying okay. to- uh, So when you look at my little visual, so typically when I make slides for my students, I typically make them very plain. I put it um, just because it's easier for my organizational level, but I intentionally put a little check mark backwards on the paper because oftentimes <laughs> I don't know if I've put a check mark backwards or written it forwards or backwards. Um, so some of the things that I do is I'm very um, intentional with my students because I only have a 40% hearing loss. I've never um, found um, hearing aids to be particularly helpful for me. Um, how I work around that is I just let students know right away when I start the class that I do have a 40% hearing loss in my left ear. Um, so I just ask them to face me when they're talking to me. Prior to COVID, I was able to do some lip reading, but that pretty much is not really a thing for me right now because of all the masks. Um, so typically what I've asked students to do this semester is just to speak up and I let them know that I know that sometimes me asking you to repeat yourself can be uncomfortable, but I really wanna hear what your input was. So if I ask you to repeat yourself, it's simply because I couldn't hear you. Um, I'm super organized with my plans. I try to map out for students at the beginning of the semester, what's gonna be due when. Um, that helps me, but it also allows them to sort of figure out what they need to do to manage their classroom assignments. Um, most of the time when I teach, the PowerPoints and the assignments are focused on not so much in class and in class we actually do a lot of experiential stuff. Um, I need to move around, I can't sit still. Um, I feel like students can read the information in the PowerPoint and they don't need me to lecture that to them. Um, I do have a handful of students that do really like that. So I meet with them one-on-one -on -one in my office hours to go through that. But otherwise, if we're doing a lesson on stress management, the classroom time is actually gonna be spent probably meditating or doing um, some sort of deep breathing relaxation technique or some sort of mu progressive muscle relaxation. It's not actually gonna be talking about stress management. Like I'll go over a few things with them in the beginning that I need them to know academically before we actually jump into the hands-on stuff. But most of what we do in the classroom is, is very hands-on. Um, I teach in health and human enrichment. So the classes that I teach are wellness choices, um, and then I teach the self-defense class for men and women. Um, because I need to move, I make sure that um, I'm accommodating that for myself and my students. Um, I do try to establish boundaries early on with them. Um, if a student's gonna ask me something or give me a note or tell me something, I ask them to help me by sending me an email. So they certainly can tell me they're gonna miss next week's class, but I also ask them to send me an email so it's on my radar. Um, and I try to be very inclusive when I teach. So I try to have um, captions on any of the videos that we use. Um, I try to, like I say, give a student's assignments well in advance. 
so they can plan out how much time it's going to take for them. Um, I have a, a basically a five day grace period for any assignment that's due. Um, I try not to go too much beyond that and I explain that to them because we focus on one thing a week. They go much beyond that. They're going to have two weeks worth of information they're trying to process and that can be confusing. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty much all I was going to share unless there were questions. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, and we're going to hear from Ann. Almost forgot to unmute myself. I really enjoyed hearing everyone's presentations today and, and hearing um, the, the things um, that uh, we do in, in teaching while disabled or with some disability that affects our work. I am a librarian at the Lamson Learning Commons. And notice um, about when I was in college, I used to. I, I remember watching this funny play about two elderly people screaming, what, what, at them. And in fact, you'll see it repeated over and over again in these sitcoms, if you, it, even current ones. The hearing loss is a, it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing to make fun of. So I deliberately chose someone today, a young person um, or a younger person that says what. And I spend a lot of every single one of my days saying what. What did you say? Can you repeat that? Um, and it, it can be very frustrating, and it, it, it and and there are some days when it's just I I feel like I am just missing out on so much in life. And um, hearing loss is actually a very common, um, very common medical condition of people who are middle aged or younger. Um, it's it, it's not a coincidence that you start receiving those hearing aid um, advertisements at about the time you turn 40. I'm convinced that they've, they've timed it, they've bought names, they've bought birthdays, and they know about when uh, you're gonna, you're turning an age where you may need a hearing aid. So um, so all of a sudden, I just, it kind of crept up on me and I realized I can't hear anything. And I didn't notice it at home as much as I noticed it at the reference desk in my work environment. That's where I first noticed it. Um, I'm a librarian, so as you can imagine, I do a lot of talking with people, a lot of helping people at the reference desk. Um, on the phone, I teach uh, public speaking um, and I do library instruction. So I'm in the classroom and literally everything else. The grocery clerk who says, here's your receipt or ask me a question as simple as, did you find everything today? And I have to ask them to repeat it. Um, I especially feel very badly though at the reference desk and on the phone um, because those students who may have very soft voice or students who for whom English is not their first language, I always worry because um, I feel like they come away from our interactions thinking that somehow it's their fault that they can't speak English uh, as a first language as well, or maybe they don't have a loud voice like other people do. And they go, I don't want them to come away with an experience with me thinking, oh gosh, it's all about me. And I can't um, um, articulate my question enough to get, um, to get an answer to it. So I um, have finally come to terms with this. And I'm like many of you have mentioned, um, in earlier uh, panelists have mentioned that they just are upfront with their class and say, you know, if it appears that I didn't understand you or hear you, it's because I didn't. <laughs> just plain and simple, I didn't hear you. Um, now I've learned some ways to cope, so I'll ask to advance to the next slide. So I have found some remedies. Um, about seven years ago, um, after I'd gotten my umpteenth um, hearing aid advertisement, I, I looked into it and was shocked at how much they cost. Talk about privileged. Um, to, to be able to have access to hearing aids is truly a privilege. And back in 2013, I didn't have a whole lot of privilege. I didn't have a whole lot of money. Um, and not that I have a whole lot now. But anyway, I discovered that um, through um, a, a person at school turned me on to the New Hampshire vocational rehabilitation. And even though the person didn't think I would qualify, uh, I, I called uh, vocational rehabilitation, which is a, a, a sub arm of the New Hampshire Department of Education. They have offices all over the state. I met with someone in Berlin and 
I found, I wrote a grant, this short little grant, and I was able to get for free a set of hearing aids. And then I had those for a while. And then miraculously, when the battery started dying on those, um, I, my insurance plan started covering a pair every, um, a full pair every five years. So that is, was truly a great remedy for me. However, as Dom kind of alluded in her presentation, sometimes they don't work really well. Um, they amplify, but still those subtleties of language don't quite work. So um, another coping remedy I have is, is simply going into the online environment. Um, I explain to the person on the phone, mostly on the phone, um, that I explain that the problem is not them, it's me. I'm the one with the hearing problem. So if they wouldn't mind uh, sending me their email address, I'll be happy to answer their reference question through, um, through either email or a chat session, uh, or even on Zoom. I do pretty well on Zoom. It's just the large classroom environment that is sometimes it's very difficult to hear people. And then you add these little things to the mix and ugh, what else could happen to me in the day uh, of having to, to use a mask and, and hear uh, what people are saying. So I have found solace, a bit of solace in the online environment and it, it makes me realize I can be helpful and I don't have to say what 3,000 times. Um, another thing is closed captioning. I wrestle the, the remote for my husband and say, let me get it. I want to turn on closed captioning. I love closed captioning. It's great. And I finally had the courage to call uh, Human Resources last month and ask uh, finally for a TTY phone at the reference desk. Because I was I'm just so frustrated that when we aren't in the classroom and there are so few students coming into the library because of COVID, that um, the phone is where they often reach us. And I want to be able to understand them. I want to be able to understand someone for whom English is not a first language. So I did um, ask for a TTY phone. Um, they're looking into it. I'm not exactly sure um, when it will happen, but I hope that it will happen um, very soon so that I can be more effective at the reference desk. So that's a little bell, a bit about me. Uh, and for the record, I never went to a loud concert. It was just bad luck, not genetic. I just have hearing loss. Thanks everyone. And um, Beth, I noticed that the other Beth, I believe has come in. So um, Beth K, are you here? And uh, yes, I think I just unmuted myself. Can you all hear me? Perfect, yes. Oh, good. Um, yeah, now that I've solved my connectivity issues, um, I've enjoyed hearing what I uh, was able to hear um, of everybody's presentations. I'm um, actually, I'm an adjunct and I'm at my day job. So uh, that's why I was having issues. Um, so I don't have a, a ton to say. I, I'm new to teaching. And like I said, that's my, it's my side hustle. Um, I teach uh, one class a week uh, on Wednesday nights. And this is only my third semester uh, teaching. So it's, it's all very new to me. Um, my hearing loss um, I've had since a child. Um, it, and it's a um, started out as a conductive hearing loss due to uh, a disease called otosclerosis. Um, and I've had, uh, I had two surgeries um, at the sort of, when I was in college um, and then in my thirties, I think started getting first one hearing aid, then uh, now I have uh, bilateral hearing aids. Um, but because it's a progressive hearing loss, um, that's why I, I can speak uh, I think like I don't have a hearing loss. Um, so how has this affected me teaching? Um, my first class was smaller than the ones I'm teaching now. I wanna say I had maybe 14 to 16 students and it was in a sort of small room. And oddly enough, I had more trouble hearing in that environment, um, possibly because of the way I, I ran the class. Um, I wanted to, I didn't think anybody wanted to listen to me yammer for two and a half hours. Um, so I tried to do some sort of, you know, get the students to, to get together and work on a problem. And then we could all discuss it. Um, unfortunately, the discussing part, I sometimes didn't hear um, what people were talking about or if 
someone had a question. Um, and as I think others have said, you know, that's frustrating, probably for certainly for them and, and also for me. Um, and I, I think, Anne, you were talking about some people having softer voices or um, that, well, you know, hearing loss, it, it affects different sort of registers, different frequencies. So I, I found that there were some students I had more trouble hearing than others. And it was kind of funny. There was one student in the front row who I, despite, I, I just could not understand what he was saying. And the student next to him would kind of translate for me. <laughs> um, and so I kind of, I, I ended up using humor, I think, as a way to get through this. Um, there was one point where I was um, erasing, I had, you know, written notes on the board and I was about to erase and I would ask everybody, are, are you all set? Can I erase this? And a student who, um, uh, anyway, a student just kind of went, mm, I think said yes, and I couldn't hear it. So I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Mm. And again, you know, anybody who has hearing loss, you realize that repeating it, it all sounds the same every single time. <laughs> um, so, you know, I said, I'm sorry, I, I think I had mentioned earlier, but I, I really do have a, uh, a hearing impairment. Um, you know, I wear hearing aids, I'm sorry, I can't hear. And this student who I actually enjoyed very much and like said, well, why aren't you wearing them today? <laughs> and so we all just kind of cracked up and I was like, all right, listen, from now on, if I say, "Are you? can I erase this? Everybody give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down and we'll go from there. And so that's kind of the way I've handled it. I've, I've tried to be humorous and be upfront and be like, I, you know, I am not self-conscious about it. So feel free to, you know, yell at me, throw something at me. If I cannot hear you, whatever it takes. Um, and so that has worked fairly well. Um, after that class though, I started having classes in a bigger classroom. I mean, oh, I, I don't think I ever said what I taught. I teach business law. Uh, so I'm now teaching in Hyde 120, which is a bigger uh, classroom. And um, now because of COVID also, I, I don't do the more, you know, students get together. I mean, half of them aren't even there. They're, you know, by Zoom. Um, so it's turned into more of a lecture um, and that's kind of disappointing to me. It's, you know, what, what this is, I, I think the biggest problem with my hearing loss and teaching is that I don't teach the class the way I envision teaching it. Um, I'm, I'm more, I tend to lecture, you know, I tend to shy away from the interaction that's uncomfortable for myself and the students. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll, if I keep doing this, I'll hopefully find some workarounds. You know, I told students this year, if you uh, need to ask a question, I have my cell phone number on the syllabus. You can text it to me like in real time in class and I'll, you know, but then let, as I said, most of them are on Zoom and they get in the chat room anyway, so it doesn't matter. But um, I guess that's pretty much all I have. Thank you, Beth. Um, so we will open it up for general questions. Um, you can raise your hand, which I think I'll be able to see or somebody here will be able to see, um, or you can post a question in the chat. Um, you can ask general ones or ones for specific panelists. So we'll open that up now. And I'm just gonna let you folks know that I'm leaving the screen share up because it allows us to keep the captioning going, um, but you have the control on your end in Zoom to open up your gallery view and kind of adjust that view as much as you want. So if you prefer not to see the slide and the caption, you can make your other views larger. I'll ask the first question since no one else is jumping in. Um, I actually have a few. Um, one thing that I heard sort of across panelists was um, one of the things that um, you know, your experiences made you aware of is sort of giving students the benefit of the doubt, trusting students, believing students, um, and really having empathy. 
I'm wondering um, if you've experienced any pushback in that from um, anywhere, other colleagues, or just sort of general feel. Um, I know there've I've been part of a lot of conversations recently, um, particularly when I talk about you know redesigning my syllabus with UDL with you know accommodations sort of built in. Um, that I am compromising rigor. And um, I'm wondering if any of you have had that experience at all where um, you know you get this sense that people don't think you're being tough enough or giving students sort of an accurate view of the real world or um, anything like that. Um, just a question for all the panelists. I see Hannah D's hand. Okay. I don't know how much you can see. Um, I'm still looking at the, the shared slide, but um, so in my um, role in campus accessibility services, um, that's primarily where I've seen um, sort of that pushback you're talking about, Beth, um, because while, so as a teacher, I try to um, use like principles of UDL so that I'm not in a position where I'm where like individual accommodations are super necessary, though of course like uh, I will I will do do them of course. <laughs> um, but when when I'm writing accommodations for other people, um, sometimes some faculty will push back a lot specifically about things like um, absences related to a diagnosis, um, because I think that that, that there's for some folks still like a general like mistrust of students like um that there's an assumption that if you have like an excused absence um accommodation then you're just never going to go to class or something um and um that that can be really frustrating um the other pushback that i think we've gotten is for extensions um on assignments which often are for you know similar reasons that people might have um, absences related to their diagnoses um, and, and it's not common like I think at Plymouth people usually do pretty well but there are occasionally some pretty extreme examples of that like attachment to rigor where it can sort of um, shock you into like uh, really realizing kind of like how attached some people can be to, to their course design. I'm thinking of an example, obviously like protecting student anonymity, but um, you know, if somebody with a, a, a pretty extreme acute like medical complication, even like to the point of crisis and like, um, I feel like if faculty were really like reading that first, they might like be more compassionate but I think the first thing they're perceiving is like the disruption to the course. And so there was some like, um, despite this particular student's like really complicated situation, the first response from a particular faculty member was like, you know, why didn't you give me more notice that you were going to need an extension sort of thing? <laughs> um, and, and it just, it, it's really frustrating sometimes. But, okay, I talked a lot, other people could talk. Thanks, Hannah, that's, that's helpful. Um, Lourdes set her hand up. So um, I have never been told that I'm too lenient <laughs> ever, but uh, I have found myself being the, the advocate for students with my colleagues, sometimes reminding them, you know, it's not because they're lazy, this person has this problem. Uh, so remember that when we move to online uh, about being flexible with deadlines, uh, and uh, but something I wanted to highlight is that I have seen a change in the past, I don't know, 20 years in the attitudes of academics, especially in the areas that I that I work in in science, where people used to be, oh, no, all students should do everything perfect when they're supposed to do it. And there's no excuse. And that, that attitude is not here among my colleagues anymore. I'm pretty sure individual faculty still have those. But uh, I think as, as a whole, we have become more understanding of students' needs that have nothing to do with our academics, uh, their uh, mental depression, um, 
you know, any kind of disability that we are aware of and, and, and providing the, the, the accommodations. So I, I, I think sometimes people might go back to the reflex, you know, why didn't you tell me on time, like Hannah mentioned, but in general, I definitely have seen a, a big increase in how supportive uh, faculty tend to be of our students, especially here at Plymouth State, which I believe we are as student centric and student friendly as you could imagine compared to any other institution I've been aware of. So anyway, that was my my point. I, I do have another comment about support to faculty, but your question is about students. So I will talk about that later. Um, we'll come back to you. We'll go to Nick, um, who also had his hand up, and then we can come back to you. Um, so I'll just say real quick that I think that a, uh, a disability minded and disability justice framework is and to a large extent um, anti capitalist and anti productivity and rigor often masks as well in the real world people work 80 hour work week, weeks, which is inhumane. <clears throat> and if our courses are built around producing like an 80 hour student week of course they're going to be inaccessible. Um, and um, and, it, and in many cases, they are going to create disability by creating situations where people are um, quite literally working themselves to uh, poor physical and mental health. So um, I don't know, just, just worth throwing out there, I think, those terms. It's interesting. I was struck, I got a email about an article, I, I can't remember if it was in the Chronicle or the New York Times, but um, it was this article about how this professor somewhere had gotten all this positive attention because they had eliminated deadlines this semester. Um, and it was just this kind of thing like, oh, isn't this you know so amazing? And, and it is, it, it's wonderful. But I was like, is that really like, is there only one person doing this? Because I can think of a bunch of people who <laughs> work with who've, you know, you know, given the pandemic, you know, deadlines don't necessarily make as much sense as maybe they did. You know, everybody's dealing with a lot of unseen things right now. Um, but it struck me as sort of in that similar vein, um, you know, just kind of the, those expectations of, you know, work at all costs, um, you know, that kind of, that kind of mindset that you mentioned. Um, okay, well, let's go back to Lourdes. So this falls outside of your question, but uh, something that I have struggled with uh, during my time here at Plymouth is that uh, we have put in place uh, support systems for students, but not for faculty. Um, when I first uh, started working here and I expressed that I needed a bigger monitor because I needed to make the font much larger, is as if I was speaking in tongues. Like nobody ever thought nobody, somebody would need a monitor bigger than, I, at that point it was 15 inches. And I have found that again and again, where if I need an accommodation, I feel like I'm bothering people mm. with my need or my request. And in fact, these people do not work here anymore, but I have had, uh, people that have made me feel like I'm just faking it because I'm not blind enough, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to ask for attention by asking for help. Uh, thankfully, as I said, those people that acted like that do not work here anymore. But anyway, there's no, uh, I don't know, funds to, to provide accommodations of, of these kinds of things. And you had to ask your department chair to buy your bigger monitor or uh, I, I just, nobody's thought of helping the faculty. And when you mention it in a group of faculty, a general group of faculty, you're made to feel bad because we need to care about the students, <laughs> not about the faculty. So uh, I don't know, I, like Anne, I was able to at least have a conversation uh, with the New Hampshire, uh, what is it called? Voc uh, Rehabilitational Services, who hooked me up with the, uh, the New Hampshire Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And even though, th because I have a job uh, that pays well, uh, I was not able to, to get financial help from them, but I was able to get a lot of advice and, and resource, it made me aware of a lot of resources 
But uh, I feel like that's something we lack here at Plymouth State, especially given how ma many people appear to have different kinds of disabilities. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that's kind of, uh, I have worked around it and I don't have any needs at the moment that haven't been met. But, but I, once in a while, I think of that and I remember how, you know, always had to fight for the help that I needed instead of there being uh, some, something already in place where you could ask for help. So. Thank you. Um, Robin had a question and then Phil. Yeah, I had a question about risk. Um, and this really struck me when Justin was talking and, you know, mental illness has been a big issue in my family. And I mean, I've been pretty open with my anxiety, but I realized as Justin was talking, I've had so little experience hearing about depression from colleagues who I know like so many people are suffering, um, but it struck me as a very brave thing to be so open and willing to talk about it. And I guess my question for all of you is, you know, many of you are in um, fairly, <laughs> I don't know if any of us are anymore, but in fairly secure positions at this point, not all of you. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering what are the limits of the, of the, like how risky is it to talk about disability personally? Um, for example, applying for jobs. I think of my daughter now applying for college and like which things would help her in an application, which things would still stigmatize her in an application. Um, like how do you guys feel, what are the risks and being open in your jobs and your professional careers, um, you know, and also potentially what are the benefits of doing it, but um, you're also very open and brave today. And I'm just curious if it gave you pause to be on this panel and talk about these things. Um, Cause I've been here 20 plus years and I don't know that I've ever heard anything like this um, since I've been at Plymouth. Um. I can just share, Robin, from my perspective, um, I, I find that it's important, especially with the hearing loss piece of my issues, to let people know right away, because even in an interview, if I'm asking someone to repeat a question, and I, you know, I don't want them to think that I'm asking them to repeat the question because I don't know how to answer it. I mean, I mean, I may not know how to answer it, but I also want them just to know that I do have the hearing loss. Um, and, you know, when I ask people to look at me and I tell them that, you know, I have been taught how to read lips, like it just, it allows them to um, conduct an interview in a way that's going to be meaningful for them too. Um, and, and if they are going to not hire me because of that, then I probably don't want to work there anyways. Um, and I've always been lucky enough to be in a position where if it's not a right fit for me, I can say no, thank you. Um, and in terms of my supervisors, um, and the way that I and the way that I teach my class is a little bit different than some of the other people that teach the same class that I teach. But because I teach it different is sort of why they approached me to teach that because so many sections of the class that I teach the wellness choices class was being switched to online being taught by people who aren't even in the state anymore. Um, you know, when Linda and Kayla approached me, it was specifically because they wanted that hands on approach. So I think for me, it's okay to share that I have, uh, you know, a certain, at least that aspect of disability initially, because I, I need them to know that so that I can at least get through the interview process. Um, I have a, thank you, Dar. I have a, a sort of different um, experience with my comfort level about sharing. Uh, again, I can't see everybody. And so did I cut anybody off? No, okay. So um, my level of comfort with talking about um, anxiety and panic disorder has um, sort of ebbed and flowed based on audience a lot. Um, and, and that, that kind of helps me determine how vulnerable I want to be and what risks, but like in signing up for this panel, it was not like a no-brainer thing. Like I, I thought about it a lot, um, both for like personal feelings of vulnerability um, because that is one of like the triggers for panic for me is like just this feeling of exposed like people know like my secrets or something like that um, 
but also in terms of employment, like, um, you know, I, I do have a, a, a full-time staff position in a role that is, you know, as things, as secure as things can be right now. I mean, it's like federally mandated. So like, and, and we're real busy. We're definitely not hurting for work. So like, probably I'm okay, but it's nothing feels certain right now. But, um, and in addition to that, there's no like, you know, I don't have like union protection or anything. Um, and yeah, and just same with like, like my part-time teaching, like I don't, I don't, I'm not part of like the adjunct union either because I'm full-time staff. So that's all like complicated. Um, so I definitely think about that. And um, depending on like what, what's going on, like six months ago, I probably wouldn't have done this um, because I was feeling like a little bit more occupationally vulnerable because I was just starting to figure out um, like diagnostic stuff for my physical things. And that was requiring um, traveling to Concord uh, for a small time weekly um, for appointments. And that was a huge stressor um, to, to the point where like, even though I was doing my job really well, there was like some perception that, that I wasn't. Um, and so that was difficult. And I had to make sure that I was protected like as far as FMLA and things like that. Um, because of the pandemic, I've been able to move my weekly and bi-weekly appointments online, which means that I'm not missing um, work hours as much. Um, so that's been sort of like a, a hidden silver lining for me. I've been able to like take care of both my physical and mental health while still being like pretty productive, um, which is not like Nick was saying, the, our, our model you know, of work and education um, tends to be fairly capitalist. And so um, there were times where I had to kind of decide between, um, you know, financial survival or my health, um, which sounds dire, but is really like pretty true. So, so yeah, I guess like this came up at the right time at a time that felt safe, um, but that isn't always the case. And I imagine that will change again. I might, uh, well, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Phil. Um, I, I do agree with, with Lourdes that things have changed at PSU quite a bit since the 20 years that I've been here. I do also think that um, given the fact that the teaching profession deals with people's ability to learn that in general, it's not a very, um, safe or sensitive environment for um, some types of disabilities. And I, I think about um, just hanging out with my colleague friends, making jokes about people that can't spell and, you know, they're great people, but it, and, and it's not especially bad, but it is the type of thing that I think people that gravitate towards teaching have all those skills that are valued by society, you know, language, performance, um, uh, knowledge retention. Um, so it is kind of a rarefied group. So it's probably the least um, sympathetic group in some ways because they're the best at what they're doing too. So. I think we got a long way to go for people to truly understand because it is so hard when you're good at something to understand that someone else might not think in those ways. And that's really, I think my biggest thing that I think about is that there's so many different brains and how they work that we all don't wanna sign up for the same job or get trained to be the same way. Um, you know, there's a, a good fit and we don't want to make everybody think the same. So uh, two quick thoughts on the um, being out and vulnerability and risk and stuff. Um, one, from the teacher uh, stable job perspective, um, I think that for disabled folks who can be out with their students, who can safely be out, and that's obviously a complicated calculus for everybody. Um, like how can we expect our students to be able to 
access and ask for the accommodations they need if we're not willing to talk about our own struggles with like fatigue and uh, anxiety and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that that's a very important thing like politically and socially we can do. Uh, but again, complicated case by case uh, 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 a situation for whether that's safe and a possibility for somebody to be out that way. Um, two, uh, so I'm fortunate enough to be hired by PSU this year. After eight years on the academic job market, which is brutal, I have horror stories. Um, I was out on Twitter as autistic when I interviewed for this job. I wasn't out in my materials, although I mentioned disability and, uh, and neurodiversity. Um, academic job interviews are brutal. They are brutal. And I think that they are like breaking, uh, like, like, like I think for... They almost force disclosure, I think, because it's, I get the feeling that over that per period of eight years, I had scuttled interviews by trying to act non-disabled and pushing myself beyond my current limits. And then people thinking like, why is he so standoffish or why is he not reacting to this joke? And it's because I literally can't right now, but I didn't feel like it was in a safe position to talk about it. So, um, so I don't know for a fact that being out let me be more comfortable because I knew that people at PSU had looked at my Twitter. I mean, I'm just pointing at Robin DeRosa, like in terms of like, there are people at PSU who are very on Twitter. Um, but uh, having my autistic identity be more of an open secret in the room, let me feel more okay about being open with my fatigue, which made me, I think a better interviewee. Um, and, um, but, but there's a like, there's a big problem there with the way we structure job market searches and interviews and um, to like weed out disabled people from the start or to force them to be open in a way that may not be safe or comfortable for a variety of reasons for them. So that's that. Those are my two thoughts. Thanks, Nick. And the whole application process in general, um, by extension. Um, we had a question. Uh, Jess had their hand up. Hi, I'm Jess. Is it a question? That's a good question. No, um, I think I think maybe I'm the only student in here. I'm not sure, um, but I'm really grateful to be here listening to all of you people share um and uh and who i can't even remember who the heck even said like commented that like they haven't heard like something like this i mean i'm not a professor so i don't know what happens at psu for the past 20 years or whatever but i haven't heard anyone talk about stuff this much um i mean i talked about stuff with my friends, but I don't hear professors talk. And Kristen is in here, and I can still remember the first I I noticed that Kristen would drink monsters, and this isn't even related to a disability. But I was like, wow, she must be tired. And my professor is tired, and I never think about my professor having feelings and being tired. <laughs> and um, and I literally woke up. <laughs> Um, and I don't think, like, I'm a pretty empathetic person. I care about a lot of, like, I think about how people feel and it's, and I think it's very interesting that I did not um, think about teachers. So I think that I'm, I'm like a lot of people here are talking about being open with students. And as far as I can tell, most people are talking about like, they're open and then students are responsive to that. And like, it's, and like Martha was talking about like the zero sum game of like care and compassion. I don't think it has to be, um, I mean, sometimes things are complicated, but I think like when I did realize like Kristen might be tired, like, <laughs> like I was like, wow, we should all have compassion for each other. And it made me a lot, um, more considerate uh, and solidarity is important and I'm, I'm grateful for the people who have been vulnerable for student with students and like Hannah was saying that like yeah like sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's less easy and like risk like 
Oh man, I'll just, everyone knows I'll say anything. I'll stay on the internet and it's there forever. Um, it's a fun time, you know, like I do talk about, I talk about suicidal ideation. I talk about every, lots of things, trauma, so many things. And like, I, do, I call it radical vulnerability. And, you know, it like, it helps me overcome the fear of vulnerability in a certain way, but I also still feel very vulnerable a lot of the time. And sometimes it's really uncomfortable. Um, especially right here, I'm the only student talking to a bunch of professors, <laughs> but it's okay. I'm leaving PSU, so it's fine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, no, like vulnerability is good. I feel like I feel like a lot of people here are feeling that that like this vulnerability is like good and like a kind crowd. That's what Hannah called us. I feel like this is a kind crowd. I feel safe right now. So. Um, I don't know. So that's probably not a question, but, um, you know, I just, I'm, I just want to say that as a student, I feel really grateful, um, to hear all of, all of these experiences. Um, and I hope other students are kind to people and their needs. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Jess. I think um, Justin had his hand up, his electronic hand. Yeah, I was uh, um, actually just going to respond to what you were saying earlier and, and um, echo actually what Hannah said. Uh, I don't think six months ago I had ever told anybody outside of my family I had ever dealt with depression. Uh, and then two students back to back were le had to leave school because of severe problems with depression. And I decided that I'd start being a little bit more open about it. Um, I then also kind of unfortunately realized that having depression doesn't make you good at helping people who also have depression. So uh, unfortunately, one has left permanently. But um, as far as I, I don't know, I realize I don't necessarily feel nervous about talking about having depression with a group, but I also genuinely don't see a lot of benefit to it um, uh, in terms of protecting myself, uh, one of the, the little things that can really cause me to have a terrible day is being asked if I'm in a bad mood early on in the day. Um, and when you have RBF and sometimes are just a little bit tired, um, people ask you that question a lot. Uh, so I'd rather not tell them that I have depression and have them bring up, um, you know, hey, you seem like you're in a bad mood. Is everything okay? To which I have to respond, well, I thought I was in a good mood, but maybe I'm not. Now I have to worry about it all day. So thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, just keeping an eye on the time, we're at 5.05. Um, Robin, I'm looking to you for your thoughts on whether to keep going, have a last call or? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think what I'll do is I'll uh, thank everybody formally for coming and I'm gonna um, end the recording now. So take a second.